Open in your Bibles, if you would, to Numbers chapter 14, from which we will draw our scripture reading this morning. Numbers chapter 14. We'll read verses 8 through 10 and then 26 through 30. This will provide kind of a backdrop to our text in Hebrews chapter 4 this morning. In Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 8, we find this. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now I need you to know the context here. The context here was God commanded the people of Israel to enter the land. And so they sent 12 spies, 10 came back. It's full of giants and scary people. Two said, Who cares? God is God. Verse 9 Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. Skipping to verse 26, we find this. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel which they are making against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. Your corpses will fall in the wilderness even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. We'll continue. In verse 31, your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will, give, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses will fall in the wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness. Dear Heavenly Father, you have given us a command to enter your rest. You've given us a command to repent and to believe. God, you have given us a a command to bow our knees to the Lordship of Christ, to receive his great blessing of substitutionary atonement. God, you have commanded us to receive you. And I pray if there's someone here this morning who's just outside of that, just on the cusp of that, that you will give them no rest until they are yours, that you will give them no peace until the Prince of Peace shines in their hearts. Lord, I beg you this morning that no one in this room or in Boyer Hall or online or YouTube, whoever's hearing this sermon, that none would die as an almost Christian. that they would submit to your command out of a belief that you'll protect them. Lord, if there's someone here this morning who does not yet know you as Lord and Savior, would you please, by your Holy Spirit, grant to them rest? And we ask this not only in the care of souls, but we ask this to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4, which will be our text this morning. Hebrews chapter 4. We will go through the whole chapter, which is quite a clip, but we we will do our best to go through the whole chapter and see what the author of Hebrews has for us this morning. 
I'll never forget the very last day of seminary for me. Seminary was three years of very intensive study and very intensive training, and I loved it. But at the end, I was tired. And I'll never forget one of the last classes I went to, my Greek professor, Dr. Edgar, started the class by saying this, I know exactly what you need. Well, when somebody says, I know exactly what you need, you pay attention. Because I was sitting there thinking, my brain is a little tired. You ever felt that way? Where you're like, I'm not even sure I could read a cereal box. My brain's a little fuzzy. And he says, I know exactly what you need. And so all the students perked up. Here's this great professor telling us what our souls require. And I'll never forget what he says. He says, go home tonight and get a good night's sleep. You need rest. And I remember thinking, well, that's great, coming from a guy who kept me up so many nights studying Greek. But he was right. What I really needed was rest. Maybe today what you really need is rest. Hebrews chapter 4 will tell us and show us there is a rest available to you. But the worst thing you could possibly do is know that a rest is available to you, but stop short of it. So this morning, we're going to see in the pages of Scripture four exhortations, four encouragements for us to keep going till it's time to rest. With that in mind, let's look at the first one. In chapter 4, verse 1, we're reminded, before we get there, of our theme verse in the book of Hebrews, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction. Remember, what this means is there are certain people who come close to the Lord, they're almost Christians, but then they shrink back. And what happens to them? They're damned. But we're those who have faith, and faith draws us forward and preserves our souls. So verse 1. Therefore let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. What are we commanded to do here? We're commanded to fear. What? Isn't fear the opposite of rest? Isn't it strange that we would start this morning with fear? Let me ask you this. It's two o'clock in the morning. You're sound asleep, and you hear a, Dad, Dad. And you're like, nah, that can't be real. Can't be real. So you roll over. And your little kid says, Dad, 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 Dad. And you go, oh, okay, buddy, what? And your kid says, I'm afraid. I had a bad dream. What do they need? They need rest. What do you say to them? Hopefully you don't say, you better get back into bed or the monsters are going to get you. (laughs) Why? Because fear prevents rest. So what is the author talking about here? He's talking about this. You can't rest until it's time to rest. You can't rest until it's appropriate to rest. If you rest too soon, you miss the rest. Let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. If you're almost tall, what are you? Tell me. If you're almost attractive, what are you? Tell me. Ugly. If you're almost smart, what are you? Dumb. If you are almost Christian, what are you? Damned. Dead. The author says, wake up. Because there's a fear that you could come right to the edge of belief and not really believe that that you may become churched, as they say. I hate that word as a verb. You may be churched 
but not saved. You may be resting on your laurels, but not resting in Jesus. So be afraid. Let me ask you this. Why do we call bathrooms restrooms? I know it's a little uncomfortable, but think. How many of you have ever said, you know what, I'm zapped, I need a nap, I'm going to go lay down on the floor of the men's room. You ever do that? (laughs) I hope not. No, restroom comes from a a euphemism. Back in the early 1900s, they didn't want to say, place you go to the bathroom in. So they called it a restroom. Now imagine you see a sign in a gas station that says restroom with an arrow pointed this way. You understand that you can't rest until you're in the restroom, right? If you just see a sign that there is a restroom and you rest, you're getting arrested, right? (laughs) Clean up on aisle five, call the cops. Some people come to church and even to Christianity and they see there's a sign pointed towards redemption and they think just because they see the sign pointed to redemption that they're redeemed. The author of Hebrews says, not necessarily. Don't rest until you know you're in the restroom. What a horrible analogy is that. I hope none of you ever go to a public restroom again without thinking of that. (laughs) See, there's real rest, and it's a promised rest. Verse 2, for indeed, we've had the good news preached to us. That's the sign. That's what points us to Jesus. We've had the good news preached to us just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Remember our theme verse. We're not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preservation of our souls. Some people hear and shrink back to destruction. Some people hear and go forward and have rest and believe. And the difference is faith. Verse 3, for we who have believed entered that rest, just as he has said. If you believe in Jesus, if you receive Jesus, you are in the rest. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, those works were finished from the foundation of the world. And the author says, look, even God rested. Even God finished the process and rested. In verse 4, it says this, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in the same passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, And those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. What is he saying here? He's saying because so many people hear the gospel, hear the word, and they almost respond. If you almost respond, you haven't responded. Verse 7. He again fixes a certain day. And what's that day called? Today. Today today. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow will never come. By the time tomorrow gets here, it'll be called today. He fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as he had as been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you're here today, today, and you walked in here today as an interested but unconvinced outsider, we praise God that you are here. We do not want you to leave that way, though. 
We don't want you to leave here almost convinced. Because to be almost convinced, to almost believe, will be to be almost saved, which means to be damned. We are not promised tomorrow, but we have today. We have now. So be afraid. Be afraid. Because there is an option open to you. All signs are pointing to the restroom. But you're not there yet. Fear. Fear. What is this rest? I think it's obvious in this context. This rest is salvation. We know this because of verse 10 where it says this. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works. As God did from his. So verse 8, if Joshua had given them a rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Friends, you may be tired. You may be exhausted. And what you really need is rest. And you'll get it. But don't stop there. Don't stop till you get the rest. And then you rest. If you are out for a long beautiful spring bike ride. What's the best part of a 20-mile bike ride? Answer, the end. <laughs> right? Because then you, you, you rehydrate, you get a shower, you lay on the couch and, ta- and think to yourself, I exercised, I'm so great. But you don't sleep halfway through. You got to finish it before you can rest. The best part of almost any workout is the end. Are you ever on a treadmill thinking, oh, I hope this never ends? Maybe. I'll pray for you. (laughs) It's nuts. That's why they have countdown clocks. You're like, all right, I'm going to do 30 minutes. And you're like, all right, how long has it been? Wow, I have 29 minutes and 45 seconds? (laughs) I feel like I'm going to die. What's the point of all this? We, that's those who have heard the gospel, must be very careful lest we miss on it, on its promise. Some of you may know some of the answers. You may be able to parrot some of the particulars, but you don't yet know Christ. Maybe you're thinking something like this. I've, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. Okay, but have you entered the rest? Have you received it? Have you put your life on it? In Matthew 7, 21 to 22, Jesus says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If I can paraphrase that, if I were standing in that group, I would say, okay, here's what I hear then. You guys did a lot. Jesus says you didn't know him. I would say, sounds to me that you were almost a Christian. And to be almost a Christian means you're not one. In verse 11, we get our second exhortation. First of all, be afraid. Hell in a healthy way, but be afraid. Be diligent is our second one. Let us be diligent. Notice what we find here in verse 11. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest 
so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Well, what example of disobedience? Well, the one we read earlier. God said to the people of Israel, go take the land. I got you. And they sent 10 and 12 and they walked over there and all of a sudden they see giants. They're scary people. And they say, well, all right, God told us to do this. God promised to have our back, but it's, it's too dangerous. It will cost us too much. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. Don't focus on the dangers. Focus on the delights. He tells us to be diligent. Greek word here is budadzo, and it means to show urgency, to take this seriously. Just like no one would ever say this. Um, by, by the way, um, this house is on fire. No, nobody's relaxed when the house is on fire. Why? Because there's urgency. Let's be diligent to, as Peter said, to make our calling and election sure. Let us be diligent, as Paul said, to test ourselves to see if we are in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13. Let's be diligent to make sure it's okay and appropriate to rest. Because Rest is sweetest when you feel okay to rest. Now, doesn't this again sound like the opposite of rest? Isn't rest the opposite of being diligent? You, like we said, you rest after a workout, not during a workout. But the rest after a workout is sweeter when you didn't stop five minutes into the workout. Make sure you do it. Why? Because we want to avoid the bad example of Israel. That's verse 11. So that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Why? And this is beautiful. For the Word of God exposes our deepest sins. Notice what it says. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What on earth is this here for? Why is this in this passage? Well, here's why. The Word of God exposes almost Christians. It exposes almost Christians by putting the truth in front of them and dividing between their thoughts and intentions. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Friends, read your Bible. Let it lift you up and let it cut you in half. Right? Let it expose your sin and balm your wounds. It does both. Verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. If I can say it this way, I don't know exactly what the experience of dying and going to heaven is. The Bible's not super clear. But I can guarantee you this. It is not a trivia test. You don't get to the, the gate and they say, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to ask you eight questions about the Bible. If you get 50% of them right, you're in. It's not like that. So the author says, read the Bible, learn the truth, let it cut you and lift you up so that when you get to the cusp of the eternal rest, 
You'll know that you belong there and will be accepted. Be diligent while it's time to be diligent. Well, what if we're already Christians? Do we still need to be diligent? Yes. The Christian life is a diligent pursuit of something we are assured of receiving. 2 Peter 3.14 Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So let's fear, lest we fall short. Let us be diligent to make sure we are in the rest before we rest. Thirdly, let us hold fast. Look with me at verse 14, my friends. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I know I'm beating this drum, but you see what he said? He said this, do not shrink back, look back, or turn back to destruction. He says this, let us hold fast our confession till the end. Let us cling to what we believe. Let us cling, more importantly, to the one in whom we believe. Let us be those who could be said, or who could say, take anything you want, but you will not take Jesus from me. I believe him, and I love him. This word here for hold fast is the Greek word krateo, and it means to cling, to grasp, to seize. To be a believer is not to just give a momentary passing nod to the Son of God. It's to hold Him and refuse to let Him go. Why? Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. What does this mean? This means when you fail for the 50 millionth and one time, and you go to Jesus and you cling to his feet, and you say, I'm not letting you go. His answer is not, you're gross. His answer is, I understand. What? The answer is not condemnation, it's compassion. It's amazing. How many times can you do the same offensive thing to a friend before they're not your friend anymore? Let's be generous. A hundred times? Jesus understands our weakness and he will not let us go, so we should not let him go. The shocking thing about Jesus, in fact, I would say maybe the most shocking thing about Jesus is that he is not shocked by us. Right? he knows he knows our final exhortation this morning let us draw near you see how it leads right to that look if you think Jesus wants to squash you you're going to stay far away but when you know that he wants to love you and bless you and pour out his compassion on you, you will draw closer to him. Verse 16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so 
that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Greek word here for draw near is pros erikomai. It means to approach. Have you ever been afraid to approach somebody? With Jesus, you don't have to be. One time I was flying to a pastor's conference and I was in the first seat of coach. In first class was Alice Cooper. You guys know who Alice Cooper is? Old-time rocker Alice Cooper. My dad loved Alice Cooper. I loved Alice Cooper. So I'm walking behind Alice Cooper, and I'm talking to my dad on the phone. I'm like, you will not believe who I'm walking behind while we're getting on this plane. And he's like, who? I go, Alice Cooper. I can't tell you what my dad said in response, but let me translate it. Wow! (laughs) And I was like, this is my chance to get Alice Cooper's autograph. Tell him, hey, I know some of your songs. I've played some of your songs. Uh, Any makeup tips, right? (laughs) But I didn't. Why? Because I felt weird. I felt weird going, "Uh, Alice, Mr. Cooper. I felt weird, so I never approached him. Alice Cooper's a Christian, by the way. I don't know if you know that. He is. I should have approached him. He would have been very friendly to me. But I was afraid because I felt awkward. Is that how you feel about Jesus? Like you know he's a pretty good guy and you know he's probably nice, but you just feel kind of awkward approaching him? Don't. Draw near to him. Approach him. He's more compassionate than you can possibly imagine. Approach him in confidence. Why? To receive mercy. To find grace. There's three things we can do to apply this command to draw near. Pray, pray, and pray. And you decide which one's most important. He tells us to. He'll hear us. So let us fear, lest we come short of being in his rest. Let us be diligent to enter that rest. Let us hold fast to our confession. And let us draw near with confidence. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 11. I can't leave it here yet. In Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28, near the end of the chapter. Matthew 11, verse 28. In Matthew 11, verse 28, we find this, beloved. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. If you are here this morning and you are not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I know exactly what you need right now. I know exactly what you need right now. Rest. Stop striving to be better than you are. Stop rebelling against the God of the universe. Look up to him, acknowledge your absolute dearth of righteousness, and say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling, and get rest. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you 
rest. You can have rest. You must have rest. And if you're here this morning and you already profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ, make sure that you've entered the rest. Be diligent. Hold fast. Be afraid. Draw near. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for those who hear me now who may not be Christians. I don't want to manipulate them. I don't want to put undue pressure on them. I I would love for you to do that. To woo their hearts to you through the beautiful ministry of your Holy Spirit. To grant them eyes to see and ears to hear. A heart to respond. Lord, would you please give them rest. There's someone here right now. Someone online. Someone listening later. That's sick of fighting you. Sick of resisting you. Sick of dishonoring you. And they're tired. Would you give them rest? Would you lead them to do something like this? Father, I recognize, Heavenly Father, that I'm a sinner. And it's, it, it, I'm not a little sinner. I'm a big sinner. And you know everything about it. But if you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in my place, and if you say that all who call on your name will be saved, and if you say that all who receive you have the right to become children of God, uh, I receive you. I call on you. Would you accept me? And Lord, I pray that you would reassure their hearts that you've never said no to that question. If it's sincerely asked. Would you save them? And then give them courage to fill out the card in front of them or to approach a believing friend or come see us out in the foyer and ask their questions and pray their prayers and be blessed. Lord, I also pray for the almost saved in the room. Those who could tell you the right things, those who even act to a certain level but they're not in the rest yet Lord would you overcome their pride their embarrassment of saying oh man I I don't want to have to admit I might not be saved yet would you overcome their pride and their resistance would you draw them to yourself And Lord, I pray most specifically for those of us who know you that we would be bold in approaching you. That we would be bold in asking you for the help that not only do we drastically need, but that you are pleased to give. No turning back. No turning back. Help us, Lord Jesus, that our lives would be to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.